Welcome, everyone. Welcome both here in the room and online. Incredibly grateful to be able to be in person, but also uh, online so everybody can have the opportunity for what, as I was driving in this morning, I was thinking of kind of like an early Easter basket of not quite surprises, but opportunities uh, to enjoy uh, real uh, deep, thoughtful engagement with the fundamental issue of cannabis law and policy here in the state of Ohio. Uh, I will introduce our first panel and we have a second panel that, that is equally exciting. And I just wanna first just say thank you all for being here and for uh, joining us online. Explain that I'm uh, Professor Doug Berman. Among the things I do here at the Ohio State University Morris College of Law is help to direct the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Our mission is very much to try to promote research, scholarship, education, uh, and ultimately community engagement and conversation about pressing issues related to drug policy locally, uh, statewide, nationally, uh, and this, these panels are, are a function of that. I'm incredibly grateful, especially to have had help from uh, the wonderful Mary Jane Gordon, who I'm gonna introduce right now, and ask her to say a few words, both about the work that she's done with her organization and um, the people she's worked with to help us both put this panel together and just ensure that our center helped move forward just such a pressing and important conversation uh, for the state of Ohio and beyond. So with that, Mary Jane, thank you. Thank you, Professor Berman. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Not raise your hand, I can take a mic. Um, it's an honor, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Thank you, Professor Berman, for working with us on this and we work with you on this presentations today. I think we have a set of very dynamic panelists here and we're all going to learn a great deal. Uh, the Natural Therapies Education Foundation, which is one of the groups that I've co-founded, uh, is about natural therapies, therapies that uh, are therapeutic for people that may not involve, certainly don't involve chemistry that we're finding in a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals. And so without further ado, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but again, the Natural Therapies Education Foundation can be found on our name.org on the internet. And so our panelists here, our esteemed panelists here today, are, of course, Professor Berman, uh, then we have here Senator Ohio Senator Stephen Huffman. Welcome. Ohio Senator Stephen Huffman is a medical doctor and represents the district that encompasses Miami and Preble counties. As a representative, he introduced and helped pass Ohio's medical marijuana law, which was called HB 523. And as a senator now, he has introduced an expansion to that program called SB 261, this, this legislative session. Next, we have Tasha Roundtree. Tasha's from Dayton, and she's a med registered medical marijuana patient in Michigan and a registered medical marijuana caregiver in Ohio. She's an embed coordinator for major moves uh, and a longtime cannabis activist in Ohio. And she also organizes expansion in clinics to assist with removal of marijuana convictions. Next, we have Justin Sheridan. Justin is an attorney and a recently appointed director of medical marijuana operations for the state of Ohio Board of Pharmacy. And the Board of Pharmacy, right now, anyway, right now, oversees the retail dispensaries that sell medical marijuana to patients. And finally, we have here Andrew Mikowski. Sorry, to say fine, but yeah, we can <laughs> finally it. is an administrative attorney with the Ohio Department of Commerce that currently oversees the cultivators, processors, testing facilities to comprise the Ohio Medical Marijuana Control Program. Now, I want to mention this. Under Senator Huffman's SB 261 proposed um, legislation and, and, the, and the proposed adult use legislation that we're going to be talking about later today, the Board of Pharmacy's functions will be transferred to the Department of Commerce. Thank okay. you. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mary Jane, very much, and I appreciate it. I actually thought I was going to have to do the introduction, so I'm already grateful to, to have part of my job for me done as the moderator of this panel. I'm also uh, grateful more generally for Mary Jane and her organization and the people with it helping us to coordinate uh, getting these terrific individuals here to help us better understand kind of where we are with the medical marijuana program in Ohio and then where and why there's advocacy uh, to move forward. Uh, Senator Huffman, I'm going to have him go last, just to give you a sense. We'll go in the opposite order that the, the panelists were introduced to uh, hopefully enable uh, Mr. Mikowski and Mr. Sheridan to kind of describe kind of the state of where we are now with Ohio's medical marijuana program. And then uh, Ms. Roundtree and, and Senator Huffman can sort of talk about some of the criticisms and 
Uh, I've encouraged each of them to give maybe, you know, five minutes of introductory, both about kind of their role in this universe uh, and, and how they see it right now. And then uh, we've got a couple of questions that we've gotten before the event, and I've got a couple of questions of my own that hopefully will allow us to, to fully understand kind of the, the, the state of the medical marijuana program as kind of a, a prelude to, as you all know, a second panel uh, that will take place this afternoon debating uh, adult use proposals and, and the pros and cons and, and conversation around that. So without further ado, uh, I'll go by first names if you all don't mind. So Andrew, and especially because you're um, one of my favorite former students, just for those of you out there. Everybody kind of ends up a favorite former student. If I see them again, the least favorites are the ones that don't want to hang out with me. And so, you know, uh, it's not a not that high a bar, but nevertheless, you, you've reached it and, and no doubt surpassed it. And so I'm grateful again for um, your participation here and, and, and the work that you've been doing with the Department of Commerce. We'd love to hear about that and, and, and how that shapes your vision of, of where we are as a state when it comes to, to medical cannabis. Sure. Yeah. Um, as, you know, thank you for the introduction. Uh, obviously, I appreciate being here. As Professor Berman noted, uh, I graduated in 2011, so about 12 years removed. Uh, I spent plenty of time sitting in those seats, and uh, we didn't have as much live streaming uh, back in that day, but uh, it's great to be back here. It's kind of interesting to see it from the other perspective. But um, as they noted, uh, I work with the Department of Commerce. We oversee the uh, cultivators, processors, and testing labs within the current structure of the medical marijuana program. Uh, you know, we've been operating since uh, HB 263 uh, passed back in 2017. Uh, we really got operational. We had the first licenses uh, that were granted shortly after that. Uh, and there was a long period of determining who the actual licensees of the program were going to be. Um, the first few years that I spent with the Department of Commerce was sorting through challenges to the licensing process, as well as uh, challenges from individual licensees to their scores. Uh, so working through all those pieces, understanding, uh, you know, how to uh, fix and, and make the application process better, uh, and adjust some of the, the uh, situations that came up during the ad that process. Um, currently, though, where I think we are is uh, on a more um, even playing field as far as that goes. We've reached the uh, number of cultivator licenses. Uh, that we have. There's no more appeals that would be left as far as cultivators are concerned. Uh, so we've maxed out the number of licenses without issuing a new licensing period. Uh, processors is in a very similar spot. I think there's maybe one or two uh, appeals that are still working their way through the various county courts uh, in Ohio. Um, but we you know, basically reach capacity as far as the number of licenses without issuing a new round of licensing. I'm sure the Justin's going to talk a little bit about how a new round of licensing kind of comes to be. So the focus for the Department of Commerce, at least at the, at the current moment, is updating the rules. Uh, have about has been about five years in an administrative law in Ohio. Every five years, you need to update the administrative rules by which your program operates. Sometimes that's no update; it's just the rule is fine. We're going to leave it as it is. Uh, but oftentimes, it requires minor adjustments, and in some time cases, there's bigger adjustments. That are uh, so the Department of Commerce has identified a few different places where we want to make some updates to our rules. A lot of them are operational. Uh, one of the interesting things about the uh, marijuana industry in Ohio and really the country is how quickly it's moving. Even 10 years ago, I don't think that many people that are in the industry could have imagined some of the things that are coming out in terms of products, processes, and uh, you know, the way that things are operating. So we are uh, doing our best to kind of catch up and adjust to some of the new things that we see. That includes things like novel cannabinoids. Um, recently, we have a, a rule update um, that expands the definition of THC within the program. It seems like a kind of a simple thing uh, to define THC, but the way that the program has defined it uh, was specifically focused on Delta 9 THC, the active ingredient the active ingredient in marijuana. The novel cannabinoids that have uh, found their way into different formulations, different process products, and some of them are occurring naturally, uh, aren't really addressed in any meaningful sense. So uh, there was a lot of talk about how do we address this. And we recently passed a rule update that wraps the THC definition and includes some of the other novel cannabinoids that you would find, not just delta 9 or THC, but include delta 8 or delta 10 or some of the other ones that we're starting to see, and wrap them up into the caps that the Ohio program has. Ohio program has a 35% uh, THC cap on flower products, uh, and then there's a 90 or sorry, a 70% uh, cap on uh, manufactured products. And there's proposals to make some adjustments along those lines. So the main thing that we're into right now is trying to find the best way to update the rules that we have, uh, make adjustments in places that are necessary, or keep the things that, uh, that we find to be effective or that uh, we found to be useful from a different standpoint. So it's, a, it's certainly an interesting industry to be involved in. Like I said, it's very quickly moving. Uh, we have, you know, so if there's new things that pop up every day, just something that happens in California or Texas or Oklahoma, uh, you know, we try to make sure that we are in line with the peer states that we have that are around us. So that's kind of the, the way that the department has been approaching the last six months and the last year since we've sort of run through our licensing. 
that's I think where I'll leave it today. Well, wonderful, Andrew. Thank you so much. It sounds like you have plenty to do, notwithstanding that uh, I know there are a bunch of proposals. We'll be talking about those in a minute that would give your uh, department even more to do. And so, um, you know, it's a reminder. I tell my students this all the time. There is so much law here, uh, and it's remarkable. Uh, how challenging it is, as you mentioned, not just the industry moving so fast, but states around the country and, and um, you know, the consumers and patients also you know, being eager to make sure the law uh, keeps up to date is, is part of the challenge. And, you know, against that backdrop, I think, Justin, your your department uh, has been keeping busy and or your board, sorry, apologies. Uh, I know that comes up all the time in this context. And it's one part of what I think has made uh, Ohio's medical marijuana program so interesting is having uh, a bunch of different departments and boards that have different responsibilities. Uh, within the fabric of the overall program. And so uh, hopefully you feel comfortable talking about the work uh, that, that your board has been doing and, and you know, maybe some of the challenges and, and um, dynamics uh, that surround that. Sure. Um, again, Justin Sheridan, uh, this is my third week, I believe, as the Director of Medical All Marijuana right. Operations well, we at the board. So, uh, yeah, we were to have this panel two weeks ago, but we figured yeah. we gave you a little bit of a break. So I apologize <laughs> for the bags in my office. I'm uh, extremely uh, busy. Um, in terms of a program update, <laughs> Uh, currently, there are 252,000 uh, patients uh, that have received uh, uh, recommendations in the state of Ohio. Uh, of, those, of those numbers, 133,000 approximately have both an active recommendation um, and an active registration, which gives them the ability to purchase marijuana at dispensaries. Uh, we have approximately 16,000 veterans, 18,000 uh, patients that are designated as indigent status, and then uh, a little over 1,000 with a terminal diagnosis uh, status. Back in June of 2021, the Medical Board of Ohio did approve three new qualifying conditions being Huntington's disease, uh, terminal illness, and uh, spasticity. We have seen several patients with those qualifying conditions receive recommendations. And then there are approximately, I think, across the, uh, the program, at least with respect to dispensaries, we do license employees, and right now we have approximately 1,800 employees uh, that are spread across 58 uh, dispensaries. Uh, we do have 58 operating dispensaries that have, that have received certificates of operation. The most recent one was released a couple weeks ago up in the Cleveland area that's amplified in District Northeast 2. Um, so that really does round out the number of dispensaries that we anticipate issuing certificates of operation, at least through that first uh, RFA process, there's potential one additional license that could be issued. Uh, but again, that's, uh, that's currently in litigation. Um, with respect to, uh, there's, there's a couple of different things that have changed uh, recently. Um, with RFA one, obviously we, we grant certificates of operation and those are specific to certain locations. Once a dispensary receives a certificate, uh, once they've been in operation for a period of 12 months, they're allowed to, to sell or change ownership with that license, which we've received several applications um, within the past year, year and a half. One of those locations is actually relocated, and that's Zen Leaf up in the Canton District. That's the first dispensary to relocate. It's a pretty uh, intensive process. It's very similar to the process that an applicant uh, would undergo with respect to receiving its initial certificate of operation. Um, with respect to RFA2, which is probably the most hot button um, topic, um, back in April of 2021, the board um, performed an analysis to determine whether additional dispensary licenses were needed. They made that determination uh, that 73 additional licenses uh, should be issued across 30 uh, dispensary districts, districts, excuse me, throughout Ohio. In September, uh, we, we went through our five-year five year, uh, rule amendment process. We updated the majority of our rules. There's still a few that need to be updated. Uh, and then later, uh, tail end of September, we did release that second request for applications. The application period ran between November 3rd through November 18th of 2021. We received approximately 1,400 applications. Uh, and we utilized a drawing component, which is a different process than the board used with the first uh, request for applications in which licenses were issued on a competitive uh, uh, evaluative process. Um, that drawing was performed by the Ohio Lottery Commission, uh, and that was performed at the end of January. The board released, uh, following that drawing, a ranked order list of the applications that are currently selected to receive those 73 provisional dispensary licenses. As part of the RFA2 process, 
once the lottery uh, was performed, the board was then required to undertake a uh, review and evaluation of those 73 applications to ensure that they're in compliance with Ohio, uh, Ohio law, Ohio regulations, as well as the, the RFA uh, instructions itself. Um, currently, we are, we're still in the process of evaluating those applications. Um, we have sent a number of requests for additional information or clarification to, uh, to the various applicants. We've received responses and we are parsing through those um, and making those determinations uh, with respect to whether the, we're able to issue licenses to those applications. Um, that's as much of the update as I have. Right now. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. And you know, that serves kind of as a useful transition uh, to Tasha, who I know has experience in, with two different states' medical marijuana programs. and. Uh, certainly, and at the risk of seeming like a troll, you know, you hear from the government officials, it sounds like it's all going well. And uh, we've got a, a, a set of government agencies that I have a very good sense are doing their level best to implement the law uh, as they're expected to do and are keeping an eye on the range of um, concerns that a medical marijuana program necessarily creates. But I do know that uh, patients and caregivers have had lots of concerns about how the program actually functions. And uh, I wonder if you can sort of share your both experience uh, and perspective on sort of how, how we're doing and, and where we might be headed. Um, as a patient in as a patient in Ohio, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian and had a 10 pound tumor. Uh, they put me on a lot of opioids, which caused a lot of additional problems that I had to have surgical, surgically reconnected and adjusted. So that left me on opioids. And I did not want to become an addict because we were going through the opioid epidemic and I was working in social services with people needing services and I did not want that to be my life. And a nurse actually whispered in my ear, you need to try cannabis. And so the only thing that we had ever heard was go to Colorado. So my family was getting ready to send me to Colorado and somebody else said, no, they have it in Michigan. And I was like, really? I had never heard that Michigan had a medical marijuana program because that wasn't my life. So I'd never heard of different states. I don't heard of California, but I didn't even know other states had medical marijuana programs because Michigan's medical marijuana program was based for strictly Michigan patients. And I was an Ohio resident. I had to go in as a medical marijuana refugee patient until I could get a Michigan address. Um, and it was actually the caregivers that took care of me because I could not legally go to a dispensary because I wasn't a legal resident. So it was people gifting me and making sure that I had RSO, making sure that I had edibles, who taught me about dosing, who taught me about the reactions, who taught me how to take care of myself. Um, that's who got me into cultivation. It was the caregivers who supplied me with a scholarship to go to cannabis college. And that's where I studied cultivation, processing, dispensary management, and culinary. So my goal became, I've got to tell everybody in Ohio about this because I didn't think anybody knew about this. And that is when I ran into the Ohio rights group and they were like, yes, we're trying to legalize. I was like, what? <laughs> And so I ran into the Sensible Movement Coalition who was decriminalizing marijuana. I had no idea any of these statistics even existed. And when I found out that seven of the 10 tickets in the city of Dayton were going to African-American males. Once you get a ticket, you are no longer eligible for all of your financial aid to go to school. You are no longer eligible to receive housing so that while you're in school, you can become stable. When I found out that some of these simple things like having possession of marijuana on your record will cause your driver's license insurance to go up. It will cause your life insurance to go up. And so these are things that people didn't even think about. And so what I did was me and my best friend got out and hit the trails and got the signatures. And we actually decriminalized marijuana. We got it on the ballot and it passed by 75%. That was two women did that. We, we went up against a giant, responsible Ohio. 
They had millions. When we defeated them, the only thing I needed to know was how do you do the Fresh Start program? Because we were at a place where we were being redlined in neighborhoods where they would put African Americans in a certain neighborhood. Those houses were valued at less than $50,000. Banks do not like to loan houses for less than $50,000. They have a high turnover rate. So now we don't have home ownership in our neighborhood. And even if you go to school, you can't get a loan because you're in a high populated area with crime, with unemployment, unskilled people, the insurance rates goes up. So when we started finding out what I did was I partnered up with Indica, which was um, the National in the National Inclusive and Diversity Alliance, Ms. Bonita Money. Ms. Bonita Money came all the way down here from California and absolutely helped me run one of Dayton's most um, successful expungement clinics. We did over 200 people in one weekend. In one weekend, we killed over 200 people's record, and I'm talking about filed and sealed. When we learned that now, when you add in wraparound services, and once I can clean your record, I can get you into housing, and now I can get you into apprentice programs like Masons. I can get you into apprentice programs like electricians, like carpentry. We're in the process now of working with a trade school to bring in the hemp wood from Kentucky and to bring in the hemp creek from Michigan. So when we talk about why do people want cannabis to feel better? What do people do when they feel better? They go to work or they have a higher quality of life. So when we say we can change and affect housing, we can create generational wealth. When we can make people feel simply better without being prosecuted and persecuted so that they have at least the opportunity to go to school, to better themselves, to then be in programs where they learn financial literacy, we can change the entire world with cannabis and hemp. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, so a little preview of our next panel a little bit, but still I think some of the backstory that uh, I sense Senator Huffman knew about and heard about when he uh, first brought HB 523, um, to be introduced in Ohio, which set the framework for our current medical marijuana regime. But um, as he will, I think, tell us, uh, he's uh, not perfect. And so left some things undone, uh, though that may have been politics as well as uh, policy, and now has introduced SB 261, which has already already moved to the Senate, I believe. And, and so, but is still um, awaiting full consideration in the House. And so love to hear your perspective, both on sort of how you got us started and sure. where you have us go. Uh, so just kind of a little history uh, lesson. So I, I am a practicing physician. I continue to practice. Um, uh, uh, I was first elected to the House in 2014. And during that time, there was a ballot initiative um, that came. Um, I thought many of us thought it was very bad because it gave 10 individuals, the sole owners of the license, to go out and make money. And those were the only 10 people that were going to uh, do that. And that was defeated. Um, and the speaker came to me as a physician and said, hey, look, we want to, um, uh, we got to get ahead of this because the next ballot initiative will, will be certainly a lot different, uh, won't have the, the monopoly for those 10 people. So uh, with uh, Chairman Shering, we had a, a, a committee um, uh, that we listened to a lot of people on the committee it was uh, someone from the children's hospitals labor unions, uh, medical marijuana industry, medical industry, pharmacy, law enforcement, addiction. And we had, we had a, a bunch of hearings and listened and, and came up with uh, uh, House Bill 523. I think at the time, uh, we didn't know what we didn't know. We made it, I believe, somewhat, um, maybe conservative is not a, a, a good word, but um, very restrictive. Uh, and, and, and I think someone said before that this is an expansion, uh, 261, I would say it is a, um, it's improving. It's not to, to have a, a, a whole lot of a, a expansion. It is to fix some of the things that we didn't know what, what was going on uh, in 523 about uh, six years ago. Um, uh, uh, the two things, in my opinion, that got uh, the initial bill passed 
uh, from a, what I thought was a very conservative uh, General Assembly at the time uh, was there's no smoking of medical marijuana in the state of Ohio and there's no home growth. Uh, and those were two things that uh, that would have never, if that was, they were in the bill, would never have passed. I mean, in my opinion, homegrown is recreational because someone will, um, if you're going to grow five plants, the neighbor kid's going to steal one, you're going to sell a couple, um, it's, it's going to be very widely used. So that's why, you know, there has not been any homegrown in the initial bill or, or this bill. Um, uh, you know, people have, have approached me and said, well, we should have care, caregiver grow, which is you grow for your patient. And again, that seems to be um, uh, uh, an expansion of, in, into recreational. You know, as a physician, I, um, Dr. Johnson was the first uh, physician in 10 uh, elected to the General Assembly. I was the second, and then I was the first when I moved over to the, to the Senate four years ago, three and a half years ago. Um, and right after we passed the bill in 16 or so, people would come to us and say, hey, look, this isn't go going right. Um, we need to change this. And I said, well, most of the time after a bill is passed, you need to wait two, three, four years um, to see actually how, how it settles down and everything. And I think pharmacy and commerce, um, again, they were very conservative uh, and very diligent in making the rules because we set kind of the framework and they were, were setting the rules. Um, and so we had to let this uh, industry, to me, in my opinion, mature for two or three years uh, to see what was right about it, what's wrong about it now. And that's how, you know, 261 has, has, has come about. Um, I don't believe that there's any huge changes in it. I mean, uh, um, and one of the things that we've tried to look at is um, um, the cost. Um, and, and so part of the thing is, and I, I forget what he said, um, there's, there's a fair amount of people that have a medical marijuana um, card, but have never bought a product. Uh, and there's a number of reasons we can talk about why that happens. But um, we're trying to drive people with this bill back into the legal market and to get out of the black market. And part of that is to, um, you know, to lower the price, make it easier. Um, we're, in this bill, we'll increase the number of dispensaries based on the number of patients. Um, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we, we went to the House fairly quickly and, and, or the Senate rather quickly. Um, uh, you know, those were also done with the, the support discussion with the governor, and now the House is, is, is trying to refine that, and hopefully in the next uh, month or so, they're um, going to have a, uh, a bill that we, we can get out. So, um, Very good. Wonderful. I, you know, I, I'm going to start the other way with sort of follow-up questions, because it sounds like, um, you know, you mentioned home grow and also smoking is sort of key elements, um, and, and those are preserved in your uh, Senate Bill 261 proposal as well is, do you think there's any movement of that on the House? Do you sense that, no, those are things that are just, just fixed with the bill as it is, and that's the only chance that, that it gets legislatively pushed? Or given that, and uh, maybe inferring from what you said, that the history of initiatives played a role in the way in which HB 523 came together, that the, the pending conversations about full legalization you know, that include home growth provisions and the like might uh, create some flex in those joints. I, I think that th those two provisions will continue. Uh, I don't think, I, I'm not naive. Uh, people are smoking medical marijuana in the state of Ohio. I'm not, I'm not naive because you can buy the leaf um, and supposedly, you know, you're supposed to put it in um, uh, kind of like vape, uh, the, the marijuana. Uh, I am truly a belief that people are rolling it and smoking it anyway. Uh, and so it, it, it's happening. I, I continue to think that uh, I think the General Assembly is just conservative enough that they're not going to go with, with uh, homegrown and change it to, uh, in that direction. Very well. well I'm, I'm going to turn to Tasha to some extent. You know, I, I don't think Michigan has those limits. And, you know, obviously you've had some experience in, in learning about, you know, cannabis from the patient perspective. Um, you know, is it your sense that those are elements that turn a medical program into a recreational program. Obviously, there's debate and support for that kind of reform, you know, in a, obviously a variety of states and maybe also in Ohio, but I'm, I'm wondering that 
that idea that if we want to preserve a true medical program, that, that those elements are problematic. I'd love to hear your take on that. And maybe uh, we'll turn to the, the government folks. I know they, they can't say quite as much on some of these policy issues, but, but I'll get them looped in in a minute. Absolutely. There is no way, as a patient advocate, I would advocate for any bill that did not have home grow um, in it. Without the ability to have home grow in it, you cannot take care of yourself. There are patients right now, we're, they're in Congress, they're in Senate debating on whether or not to have insulin at $1,200 or $35. If I can grow my own beans, greens, potatoes, and tomatoes, why should I not be able to grow my own cannabis? When you go to a typical dispensary, they are there to provide you with your meds, not a one-on-one -on -one consultation. No one's gone to school to tell you what strain works best for you, what delivery method. Now, when it comes to smoking versus vaping, smoking got booted out because it is the least effective. That does not mean it is not effective. So the ability to smoke should be in any bill. Because we have a three-letter word, non. Non-combustible means we are not allowed to smoke. That is why we don't have reciprocity. If dispensary owners wanted more, they wanted more sales, they would welcome more customers. The same way Michigan will honor our patients' cards, we should be honoring other patients' cards from other states. And instantly, you would see people dispensary numbers go up because people from out of town would, able, would be able to use our facilities. People, we're, we have a, a, a system that is based on the sickest and the poorest people in Ohio. We literally are taking care of terminally ill people, but we're trying to make money off of it. So we need caregivers and we need schools to be able, if I can go to Carousel Beauty College to get my hair done at a cheaper rate because it's by a student, I should be able to go to a cannabis college and get taken care of by a person going to school to learn to be a caregiver. A caregiver simply is a specialist. If we're going to call this a medicine, why don't we call caregivers a specialist? Why don't they go to school to get a certification so that they have now a, a educational background to say that they are certified in working directly with patients who have special needs? We have specialists in everything else in medicine. Why wouldn't we have this in cannabis? If that's what we need to call them, they can go to a cannabis college and get a formal education at an accredited school. And now we should have a caregiver. Caregivers should be able to work directly with other cultivators to say, I found something that works for these type of patients. Now we can mass produce it and work with the caregivers or work with the cultivators who have license to cultivate. Caregivers should be able to work with processors to say, we don't need to make 100,000 packs of gummies. We need to make 10,000 packs of this type of gummy that helps with this type of patient to have a more specialized skill. If I can go to, to the grocery store and get wheat bread, white bread, potato bread, we should have a specialized skill. And what that does as a caregiver, it says, let me open up my skills. So now we're talking about building an economic platform where you go from being a caregiver to a micro giver. So now we have a way of going from a small business to a medium business to a full blown by making these people work together. By having a voice and working directly with patients, the patients are telling you and dictating to you what they need. We're just giving them and saying, hey, you need this. Hey, this is popular, this is hot. Here, have this, versus them saying, what do you need and how can we better take care of you? Recreation means you know what you want. I don't need to work with you. Medical simply says, if you have a problem, we're here to work with you to make sure that we work specifically with you to get you what you need. Thank you very much. It reminds me both of these sets of comments of uh, you know an issue that uh, I know my students have heard me talk about for years and, and uh, actually was, was brought to me on this stage a bunch of years ago when the Responsible Ohio proposal was, was making the rounds, which highlighted the fact that we have very few things in our society that we sort of successfully think of as both medicalized and 
recreational, right? That, you know, things get put in one camp or another. And they said that cannabis both um, is rightly perceived in, in both camps and there's reason to want to preserve it uh, in, in both models. Uh, th th that creates this, this sort of ongoing tension and also an, an alternative to uh, our, our regulators. Um, you know, the challenge of um, dealing with an industry that has, you know, perhaps an inclination to think of uh, patients as consumers, to deal with patients who have an inclination to uh, want to be thought of as patients, but still service like consumers. Uh, and then also, um, you know, the range of other challenges, whether it's caregivers, whether it's obviously um, the, the politicians who are keeping an eye on where they think this is going and what they think is essential as a matter of policy. You know, who do you hear from the most? And, you know, do you think that will change with something like SB 261? It obviously would change if any of the uh, full adult use proposals become law, although even you know how that accommodates a, consist, a persisting medical industry is, is always a, a challenging question as well. But you know, if you feel comfortable speaking about it, you know, obviously your departments have traditional audiences, but does the cannabis conversation skew that or at least you know, surprise you in you know, who has what issues they're bringing up? And I'll, I'll get to some specific issues in a minute. That, that came as some questions to us beforehand, but I just maybe, you know, sort of speak to, you know, how this feels relative to the other things the Department of Commerce does, how this feels relative to the other things that the Board of Pharmacy deals with. Is it just yet another, yet another thing we have, or is it, is it a completely, you know, different animal? So at the board, we really operate in two, two distinct areas, right? There's the traditional pharmacy area uh, where we regulate, uh, you know, pharmacies at the state of Ohio. Uh, licensed pharmacists and other individuals that work in pharmacies, which is very comparable to the other component that the board regulates, which is medical marijuana dispensaries and those employees. Um, we have a very, I would say, a very good working relationship with, uh, with respect to the industry. We meet frequently with, uh, with associations, which rep with representatives of specific dispensaries to discuss issues that they're experiencing, uh, you know, ideas that they suggest that they believe will improve the program. And the same with respect to patients and caregivers, we have designated email inboxes where we receive emails from patients and caregivers and we address those concerns really on a daily basis. Um, you know, how that may change with respect to like legislative changes, I, I really can't speak to that. Um, uh, I think Senator Huffman or maybe Andrew could speak to, you know, the proposals that are currently um, you know, before the General Assembly. Sure, and I can I just kind of piggyback on what Justin was saying, you know, I think that at the Department of Commerce, we're, we are a step removed from sort of the patients. That's not to say we don't hear from patients uh, directly, but we really, our regulatory uh, structure puts us in the camp of dealing with the producers. Uh, so we deal with cultivators, processors, and testing labs, and the mission that was kind of provided by the uh, original statute that enabled both of the, uh, the programs, the Board of Pharmacy, as well as uh, we're sort of missing the medical board. They're another component of this, but not really the, the thrust of what we're talking about here. But um, that was to, to give a safe and consistent supply of medical marijuana. Um, prescribed, not prescribed, sorry, recommended for certain purposes and certain conditions. Uh, and the program was built up around those ideas. We want safe and we want consistent. And that necessitates the use of the testing laboratories, the control of sort of the amount of supply and the, uh, the amount that um, the cultivation space, the uh, ability of processors to sort of bring certain products and certain ones that are not particularly allowed. The statute sort of defines what the particular forms of administration are. There's methodologies of ways to sort of propose new ones and make those adjustments, but uh, you know, the Department of Commerce and the Board of Pharmacy are creatures of statute here. We are sort of constrained by what we are given uh, by the legislature. So without some adjustments to those things, it's difficult for us to make kind of like large sweeping changes as far as that goes. And I think when speaking, you know, specifically to some of the, the concerns that we hear, you know, price is obviously something that becomes a fair amount. Uh, there's many proposals on ways that you can kind of drive down the prices. Um, the, the ability of testing and recalls is something that comes up a fair amount to us and how the department handles those, the board pharmacy handles those, and to make sure that, you know, if something does make it out that it should, you know, that it was tested, that it had all the, the different pieces, and, you know, the, the different recalls that we've dealt with have been, I think, dealt with very well and professionally on both of our sides. I think that we work very closely with the board of pharmacy on all of these particular matters. Um, and I would say that our, probably the people that we deal with the most is the industry, 
making requests or making suggestions, making them proposals as to how the program could work better uh, and be you know, more effective in terms of delivering that safe and consistent supply. Can I address that? Please do. I was going to turn to you next. No, I was going to how we came about no home growth. So um, two, two, two things with um, homegrown. I don't know any other medication that anybody's growing at home for their own medication. And the other thing is, is, is the safety. The General Assembly, in my opinion, has the duty to make sure that this safe product, it's mar marijuana, is it gas and oil or whatever, is a safe product. And um, two things happen in, in, um, in marijuana. One, uh, if you're spraying, there's bugs, bugs that eat marijuana. And if you're spraying pesticides on that, and then you're consuming the pesticides, one of the things the Department of um, uh, the testing does is to test for pesticides and make sure that there's no, uh, that chemical's not in there. The other thing that happens is um, there's toxic mold. So often you hear from amateur growers or, uh, and there's a concern from professional growers, if they're growing inside within about two to three years, that warehouse where they're growing is filled with a toxic mold that will get onto the plant that can cause a lot of harm if, if people are smoking it and, and eating it. So, um, you know, back in the 60s, um, the THC level, the average THC level of marijuana was about five to 6%. Uh, today, there is about 5,000 different strands of, of marijuana uh, in the, in the, the um, THC potency gets to, to be about 30 to 35%. So it's a lot different than before. Uh, and so I, I think that because of the safety uh, and, and making sure it's a quality product is, is one of the other main reasons not to have, to have the home growth. I feel like we, we have other comments on this thought, although I want to get back to Senator Huffman about the, the regulatory structure in his, in his new proposal. But Tasha, go ahead. I can see you've taken a, a, a sip of drink, so you're ready to respond. That is so ridiculously crazy. Ridiculous. How many of you wake up on Saturday morning and go to a farmer's market to buy your bread? Does your food have to be regulated? No. How many of you eat cucumbers, tomatoes, or vitamin C? Does, does, your, does your vegetables have to be regulated? No. So let's look at who's had the biggest recalls. How many recalls do we have in the state of Michigan from caregivers? That answer will be zero. Now, would we like to talk about the recalls? in the medical marijuana field in the state of Michigan, where 90% of all the dispensaries had to shut down and recall their product. So let's talk about public safety. Let's talk about how, how many of these dispensaries are now washing the weed in peroxide to prevent the mold. You know why? Because weed, I'm sorry, cannabis really should be grown in small batches unless you've studied large scale cultivation. And that you would learn in, Israel. Israel is the number one place in the world where you study large-scale cultivation. Again, as a caregiver in Michigan, I went to Grassroot University and studied cultivation. So we simply, if you go to Cleveland Cannabis College, they will tell you and show you how to grow organic. I'm not going to flex or pop my collar and say, I know Christina De Jesus from Galena. I know that Galena provides some of the best organically grown product in the state of Ohio with some of the best numbers of no recall, highest standards in the state of Ohio. I'm just gonna say, we can't use mythological reasons as to why we should not have home grow. So we must have realistic reasons. Do we need security if you're growing outdoor? Yes, but if we have a secured number, a small number, like the number six or 12, so I would even be willing to compromise and say eight. If we can't compromise, none of these bills are going to pass because this is a Republican bill. This bill is designed to help companies. This bill it has absolutely nothing to do with lowering the price for patients. The only thing they want to do is have more patient access. They want to be able to say, if you have a broke toe, we can get you some marijuana for that. If you have this because the more patients that they have, the more cannabis they can sell. So this bill has absolutely nothing to do with patient care. This is strictly about money. This is strictly about business. But if they want to handle business, they should look at models where they do expand it so they do have home growth so that you do have a compromise 
between the Democrats and the Republicans. When people write these bills, expensively paid people like lawyers make a lot of money writing these bills, but none of these bills pass. And that's like saying, hey, but I did try. I wrote that bill. It made it through. It passed. It, it almost made it. Can I get another $12 million? And we'll try that again. And we'll try that again. Versus the Democrats and the Republicans compromising, coming together to write something that will actually pass. It's like, do I want to be on the winning team? Or do I want to say, we didn't win, but I made the final jump shot. We need some politicians who want to win. That means you're going to have to compromise. We're not, the people are not going to vote. And if they vote, if any senators, any state representatives vote for any that does not have home growth, we will vote you out of office. Senator, I don't know if you have a response to that. Or I just <laughs> say that uh, six years ago, the initial bill was overwhelmingly bipartisan. Uh, um, uh, signed by a Republican uh, governor. Uh, when it came out, 261 came out of the Senate. I believe more Republicans voted no than Democrats, uh, and it was overwhelmingly um, bi bipartisan. So we have come together as, I, I don't see medical marijuana as a, as a um, bipartisan bill. I, it is a bipartisan bill. I don't see that one, one side has one or the other that both, like I said, it was overwhelmingly supported by both parties. So uh, I don't want to get too deep into the sort of fight over whether this is about money or not, but I will kind of uh, turn to the question I had in mind, and we're going to turn to the audience in a few minutes to, to allow some questions as well. But uh, to the extent that your bill puts all of the regulatory authority into commerce, as I understand it, that at least on the surface could allow the suggestion, hey, this is about money. You know, at the end of the day, we're taking out uh, at least, you know, some of the protections that make this look like medicine by having the Board of Pharmacy in charge, putting it all in front of commerce. Again, you know, maybe that there are patient advocates and others who would say, you know, we need to just get the commerce going and that will be good for patients. But is there, you know, uh, either an accounting for why uh, either, you know, commerce gets to be the, 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 the regulatory king uh, under the new bill, or at least a, a, an explanation for why that isn't just an effort to give more power to the agency that as Andrew uh, described, you know, industry has the most interaction with. Well, I, I think it's, a, it's about uh, getting the government out of the way in the sense that um, there's some um, dispensaries, cultivators, um, uh, the processors, interact and to go to two different departments is, can be cumbersome uh, and to move it to over to one. We're not gonna totally cut out the Department of Pharmacy. Uh, if you know what the Ohio Automated Reporting System is, is so all medical marijuana is reported to a data bank, uh, like all narcotics, uh, a physician can, uh, and so that will continue at the Department of Pharmacy. Um, and, and a lot of 261 um, is about, um, is about the business. It, you know, I, I've had discussions with members of the General Assembly about, well, I'm not sure if we should have medical. Well, that decision was made five years ago. The decision now is to make the industry better. Um, it, you know, I'm told that the, the most Ohioans, the lo, Ohioans get um, their medical marijuana from um, Southern Michigan uh, more than any other dispensary. We want to have them stay here in Ohio. Um, you, you know, we have no tax on medical marijuana because the Constitution of the state of Ohio says you shall not tax medication or food. Well, when, once we decided it was medication, we have, we have no tax on that. So um, it, it's a large amount, um, you, you know, um, like I said, we didn't know what we didn't know. It's about uh, less testing because we know just because you move it from, from the, the cultivator to the processor, it's in a sealed bag. It didn't change. We don't need to keep testing it every time it moves. So a lot of the bill is is to um, uh, get rid of um, uh, the things that we didn't know were going to happen um, before. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, I think we have about 15 minutes or so, and uh, I know there are folks in this audience who probably know a lot more than me about a lot of these issues, and so I'm eager to open it up for questions, as is always the case. My students get first shot, so if any of them want to throw their hand up and uh, and, and ask something, and I'll probably recognize them most quickly, but uh, but uh, anybody in the audience, and I, I know uh, the, the staff at the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center who 
I meant to thank robustly for getting us coordinated this way. Also may be able to, to monitor if there are any online questions. So please feel free to, uh, is it the Q&A or the chat? That's the better way to do that. Q&A, so feel free online to use the Q&A if you wanna throw some questions in and uh, don't be shy folks. Come on, we're here in person. This is why you came, Just throw your hands up. Oh, way in the back, I'm gonna go actually. I have a student first, you'll be next. You'll be second, sir, go ahead, Alex. Uh, thank you all. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Alex. I am a professor of residence in marijuana law class. Uh, and we have been studying a lot of this stuff. In fact, my project uh, compares uh, your stimulus bill for states one and two overall as a uh, medical marijuana degree. I'm not saying that you're going to allow the spindery to open up on each side of the street, left and right, um, as far as the eye can see. But there are some comparisons. And uh, I, I want to practice by saying, I actually think your bill is very good. And it's very good, carefully crafted. Thank you. I, and let me say, I am a practicing physician. I do not have a certificate. I do not recommend medical marijuana. Uh, I just, I, I thought it was a conflict. I shouldn't pass a law and then go profit from it. So I don't do that. Uh, if I remember right, it, it says that uh, uh, it's based on the physician's education and training that they could uh, uh, recommend. Uh, and today, I believe in uh, the House Committee, they, they accepted an amendment that would say that is comparable to any other currently allowed condition. So um, I don't disagree with you. I've had many conversations on that, uh, on, on that clause. Uh, um, and uh, the legislative process is a process. Um, and so sometimes you, you need to uh, give a little in one place and uh, get something someplace else. So I understand the, the controversy and the concern about that. Okay, in the back, as I promised. Uh, so my name is Corey. I'm a Corey. I am a community resident pharmacist. So Corey is a community resident. My question, uh, Senator, and it's not too much of a doctor question, although I got one to clarify certain things. So uh, if we were discussing some of the working points that are presented in the home line, now we're kind of making it recreational and you guys can kind of go to the kids and they were kids and you can start selling it. Um, hypothetically, if I'm someone now who's going to <coughs> know what I can tell the doctor, get my cards, go to the dispensary, sell that supply to whomever makes it or whoever I'm going to sell it to, uh, I'm just circumventing the law that's written right now. And what you're here is I guess my question is, how do you reconcile with that fact that I think there are some people who are based on what I see in the court um, allowing themselves to have these cards and this access, but uh, as the gentleman before mentioned, probably aren't always uh, people that the person has let me jump in just because I want to be able to repeat the question. Hopefully I'll summarize it uh, quickly for the online audience. Basically the major concern expressed before about home grow is that people would circumvent the law and it would make a cannabis sort of accessible to everybody, you know, rather than consistent with medical conditions. But uh, it may be the case. And in fact, I think you mentioned, you know, people smoke it in Ohio. So we, we've we already had a discussion of the reality that all the regulations that are currently in place aren't consistently followed. Uh, the, the offer of the question uh, is a pharmacist who says, you know, he can tell that there are maybe some uh, who prescribe now and who um, make cannabis available 
uh, not consistent with existing regulations. So if we know there's going to be circumvention of any regulatory scheme, you know, why put more restrictions in place, you know, simply because we're worried that maybe, you know, some folks won't, won't follow the letter of the law. Well, I think that's why these guys have investigators that will go out just like when I somebody breaks their leg and I uh, prescribe a narcotic on Vicodin, if they go home and give it to their neighbor and they sell that, they're, bra they're breaking the law uh, and, and are subject to investigation. And I can look at the ORS report uh, and say, you got 120, 150 um, uh, Vicodin from one person and a week later you got another 150. Uh, you know, this is wrong and report it to the Department of Pharmacy and they'll do an investigation. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I think that there are some, uh, uh, through the investigation process of these gentlemen's um, departments, will look into that. So we'll have to make it criminal again. So we'll have to make it criminal again. Well, you know, it's, I, I, I think Tasha's raised to the point, which is always a good one, which is the more regulations you have, the more you have questions about how enforcement is going to take place, not to use this as a way to get our, our regulators back in the conversation. How much do you view your role? How much do you worry about your role becoming about enforcement as opposed to facilitation, right? Because they're, they're both going on, you know, by necessity. And, um, you know, is that something that, that in, in the other work that your board and, and, and department do, just the inevitable tension or is again, this sort of constant question of is cannabis unique? Is there a unique challenge of, um, you know, an enforcement requirement among regulatory agencies? Because we know uh, that this is a product that's widely desired and that, that there may be many more players, industry players, uh, consumers and others uh, who are eager to evade whatever regulatory restrictions are in place. At the board, uh, we have, agents that deal exclusively with traditional pharmacies, uh, just as we do have agents that are devoted entirely to the medical marijuana control program. Both agents across both of those two industries, they investigate both administrative violations and criminal violations. Um, so I think that there are synergies there across the, the, you know, the two programs, so to speak. Um, so I don't think that there's any difference between you know, the work that agents that deal exclusively with marijuana, if there's any difference, you know, other than the rules and the laws that they, you know, investigate, um, there's any difference across the, the traditional pharmacy area. Kind of for commerce's part, I think that there is a tension between these two ideas. I mean, not simply because medical marijuana is, you know, is federally still illegal. There's that aspect of it where all of this uh, could be deemed a federal crime in many cases. So there's naturally a tension between what is criminal, what is regulatory, what is the enforcement responsibility as far as that goes. Uh, I think that the design of the program, again, kind of to build a safe, consistent supply includes looking at people that are deviating uh, from those particular pieces, whether it's, you know, a dispensary or a cultivator or something, if they're moving it outside of the supply chain, moving it outside of the testing regime, that's something that I think the legislature designed the system to avoid. So if there are people that are going to buy it and then sell it to them, you know, to friends or neighbors, uh, I don't think that SB 261 does anything to, to change that, uh, as it still would be deemed a sort of a criminal enterprise under the regular laws of the state. If you are out here selling weed or selling drugs, you are selling drugs. But what we need is an inclusive way to get people who used to sell weed or drugs into a legal market. They already know the market. We just need a way to get them a clean record so that they can participate in a legal arena. If this comes again with training, that is why we have schools like Grassroot University, like the Cleveland Cannabis College, because we can teach you how to cultivate, but we can teach you what the rules and the regulations are. If we have rules and policies and procedures for people to participate, you will have more people who will participate in a legal arena versus an illegal arena. It is only when we prevent those people from getting into the arena in the first place. Again, if you don't have a clean record, you may have got caught with a joint 25 years ago. You can't go to Cleveland Cannabis College right now. You can't work in the cannabis or the hemp industry. Central State University has a hemp program right now. I can't send people to, when we do an expungement program, I do wraparound services 
and education is one of them. Because once we seal your record, you can apply for financial aid. I try to get people into agriculture and show them that cannabis is not the gateway drug. Cannabis is actually an exit drug. When you go, I work with a group called the 115 Project. That is a recovery program. When you go into recovery, they will, the doctor will first issue you a value and a muscle relaxer because when you are going through withdrawals, you will tend to shake, shiver. You will tend to go through convulsions. Some people have gone through seizures. Some people have gone through strokes. What we can do is give you edibles. I have given people um, edibles and then I've given people gonna leaves cream with the CBG in it. And that helps with the muscle aches. It helps with the muscle cramps. It will stop all of that. They will ask you at the 115, would you like to use medical marijuana or would you like to use pharmaceutical drugs? If they choose medical marijuana, I walk them through the process. We have their first experience with them. I do an allergy test first, because if we're gonna treat this like a medication, let's first make sure you're not allergic to this. These are things I learned in Michigan that they do not teach. These are not the standards of the state of Ohio. So if we raise our standards and treat this like a medication and accreditate and teach, educated people are sometimes the hardest people to educate. And so if you have gone to medical school 25 years ago, you were not taught about the endocannabinoid system. You had to go and spend money to go take extra credit to learn about this system. So if you think I went to medical school, I know what I'm talking about. And here it is, it's a new system that's been brought up that you actually don't know anything about. And now as a patient, I've taken the plan to do all the education that I need online in classes and now as a patient, I'm more educated than some of these doctors are. So having law schools that are now dealing with medical marijuana law, because now we have businesses that are conducting business, and now we need to make sure people are compliant to the laws that we are writing. So if law is raising its standards, medicine must raise its standard, and now business must raise its standards. We all have to move together because we're fighting over Ohio medical marijuana. Guess what? This is an old conversation <laughs> because the new conversation is not even federal because we're about to be federal. Within the next couple of years, we're federal. What our conversation needs to be so that we are not behind the ball again, let's talk about that international market. How do we get these lawyers ready for the international medical marijuana uh, market? How do we get our, our items compliant so that now we can internationally send up to Canada. Now we can send it down to Mexico. Now we can send it down to Uruguay, South Africa. We can send it over to Europe. Let's, this, this whole Ohio, this is over. Let's, <laughs> let's fix this real quick so we can have real conversation about the international market because I would like my product everywhere around the world. I, I'm very grateful to, to have recommendations for what I'll be teaching next year, which I, I very much appreciate. And I also especially know uh, my wife certainly agrees with your idea that sometimes the educated are the hardest to educate. So uh, <laughs> no doubt about that. We've only got a couple of minutes left. I want to make sure that was uh, pretty close to a last word, Tasha. So I hope you don't mind me thinking that that was in your terms that I want to give everybody on the panel. And I'll, I'll end with Senator Huffman, uh, since he in some respects got us here and, and is, is moving us you know, forward at, at, at the State House. Andrew and, and Justin, I don't know if you have a, a couple last words or, or last things you want this audience and those online to, to think about going forward. No, I would just say I, I appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to stick around for a few minutes afterwards if there's something specific. But this is an enlightening conversation. It's always useful to kind of see the other perspectives. I think that it's easy in the regulatory spot to get a little bit of tunnel vision when it comes to these things. You're focused on the regulations you have in front of you. Good to see the perspective forward looking for yeah, likewise, uh, there's a lot of change going on right now at the Board of Pharmacy. Um, we're excited about what's uh, going to be happening in the near future. Uh, and we look forward to working with uh, you know, our licensees, uh, including patients, caregivers, and dispensers. Senator Huffman, you wanna wrap us up? I think, uh, I hope Tasha agrees. We're here because of the failure of the federal government, in my opinion, is that this should not be a scheduled one drug and if they moved it to a scheduled two drugs, 
academic institutions like Ohio State would go out there and do the double blind studies and the research and say, um, this really what this THC and cannabinoid uh, estradiol level really works for this, or it doesn't work for that. And so it's the failure of the federal government. You know, medical marijuana has been approved by the FDA in the form of Epidiax from um, GW Pharmaceuticals to treat seizures. And it's a product of medical marijuana that's, that, that's made in England. So uh, I think if, when the federal government, we've seen that recent, uh, the House recently passed something, um, and I, I'll disagree with you because uh, I don't think that's a very good law. I think that the states, I mean, we have about 38 states with medical, about 16, 18 with recreational, that the states should be the ones that decide that. Uh, um, and I believe also, um, you know, Representative Ferguson's here, we will have recreational sometime in the near future. It's the near future, three years or five years or 10 years, but I think we will. And um, uh, I just look forward to working with you guys and, and the, the regulatory people to, to get a, a good product for the patient. That's what it's all been about for. Uh, I, I so appreciate that. Senator Ruffin. Uh, I thank all the panelists here. I'll sort of wrap up by saying, you know, not just a prediction uh, from somebody working on medical marijuana bills that, that, that full adult use is coming uh, here at some point. It's just a question of when, but that doesn't make this conversation go away, right? I, I was speaking to a reporter just today about my fear that often in recreational reform states, the patients get forgotten. There's a sense in part because the industry is now focused on a broader consumer base, that there isn't as much energy and effort. Uh, and especially that issue about you know, tax rates. Uh, I hope in Ohio, since we do have that constitutional provision saying you can't tax the patients, that there will at least be uh, a tax reason that the medical cannabis community will wanna preserve the structures you're, you're looking to put in place. Uh, and so those are important conversations to continue even if uh, recreational reform is inevitable. That's what our next panel is going to be discussing uh, across a variety of dimensions. And uh, I'm just eager at this point to give us some time for transition and to thank our panelists here for. So I think we have five minutes for transition. So uh, let's head on up there and thank you so much. <laughs>